Good morning. Welcome to the morning worship service here at Creefall Church of Christ. We're so glad you're with us. Let's begin our worship by standing, please. Seated, please. Well, again, welcome. So glad to have you, especially if you're visiting with us. You're our honored guest, and we're so happy to have you here. We hope that you'll fill out one of those red cards, put the sticker on. We want to meet you, and hope that you'll stick around for our classes afterwards. We're going to be focusing on prayer this morning, and Bill's going to be speaking about prayer and the various ways that God may answer our prayers. So with that in mind, Ronnie Boone's going to come and read our scripture for the morning, our focus, and then we'll spend a minute or so uh, preparing ourselves for worship. The reading this morning is Jesus speaking to us as recorded in Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 8. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend, and go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he (laughs) will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me, The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give to him as many as he needs.
After this song, Alan Bradley will direct our minds in prayer. <coughs> hey, Phil. It's good to see you. Will you bow with me as we approach our Father's throne? Heavenly Father, creator of all that is, we're so thankful for the privilege that we have to gather together, to worship you, to speak with you in prayer, to tell you how much we love you and how great you have been to us, how you blessed us throughout our lives. Many times we disappoint you, Father, and the way we live our lives. We make mistakes, but we're thankful that through your love, we have forgiveness of sins. We have grace in that you give us forgiveness, and we have mercy in that you don't give us what we so often deserve. Father, we're thankful for those that serve here as elders, those that work as deacons, those that work as ministers, we ask you to be with them, Father, and strengthen them that they can always stand for the truth. We're thankful and pray for their wives as they support them in those works. Father, there are many times injuries that occur in life, illnesses, death invades our, our homes, and we, we come to you in prayer asking for your strength to comfort those that are hurting. We ask you, Father, to be with us as we worship you this day, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth, that we know that as we pray, our prayers are answered. Many times we don't understand that answer, Father, but help us to always trust and trust in you and trust in your love for us. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing this song. We're going to sing this song focusing on the prayer that Jesus prayed the night before he died, and then we'll share in communion together, and Craig Bennett will lead our thoughts as we do so.
know many times when we're singing, we, we say the words, but are we really stopping to think about them? So I want to take us back just a couple of minutes, and I'm going to read from the song that we just said. In the Bible, we read of a beautiful prayer, a prayer, a fervent prayer, sent to heaven above. It was prayed by a heart that was laden with care and filled with such wonderful love. You can catch the sad tone of his voice as he said, thy will, not my own, must be done. As a lamb to the slaughter, he soon must be led to die, yes, to die, as the crucified one. As he prayed there alone in such deep agony, it was a most beautiful prayer, just to think his great heart was all broken for me, that he, my great sorrow, must share. And, and said, when the Savior was praying in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, loving Father, if you will, let this cup pass from me. I know he was thinking of the anguish and death would bring to his own. How deep was his sorrow when Jesus was praying alone. Gentlemen. If you'll bow. Father, we thank you for the wonderful gift that you've given us, the gift of your son, his life, his death, his resurrection, that we, Father, might be able to join you one day in heaven. Help us to think about that, Father, every day, but in particular right now, Father, as we take of his bread, and it's through his son's name we pray. Amen. If you'd bow. Father, we thank you again for the gift of your son, the blood that was shed 
so that we might be cleansed, our sins forgiven. We thank you for that gift, Father, and help us to think about it in all that we do. And it's through your Son's name we pray. Amen. In preparing our minds for the contribution, I'd like to read a couple of verses. First from 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as being prospered, so that no collections will have to be made when I come. And then I'll read from James. 1 verses 17 and 18. Every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. We truly have been and have been given the first fruits of Jesus by being his creation and then God sending his son Jesus for us, giving us his first fruits. And so the question for all of us, as we think about how we have been prospered, are we giving back our first fruits? Where does our spending rank? Um, where does my giving rank with how much I play golf or go to ball games or whatever else we may spend it on? There's not a set amount, there's nothing like that, but we are asked to give our best. And that's for each of us to determine and for us to think about. If you'd bow. Father, we thank you for the many material and spiritual blessings, Father, that you've given us. Help us, Father, to, to give, to give liberally. And Father, we pray that you would be with the elders of this congregation as they look over these funds. And it's through your son's name we pray. Amen.
We'll sing this song, and then Bill will bring us our message for this morning. Prayer is is down its own. That's good. We're going to talk about prayer, and I hope that it's going to be helpful to you because it's not simple. I I don't know about you, but uh, I think if you've prayed for any length of time, you've had times you've prayed and prayed and believed and wanted, and and things didn't happen. They just didn't happen when you thought that they should, or maybe they didn't happen at all, and you were sure that was the right thing. You know, nobody ever had a more positive view of prayer than Jesus. He said, whatever you ask in prayer, believing you'll receive. He said that, and yet even the Lord himself did not receive all the answers that he prayed for. We talked about it this morning. In the garden, he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And it didn't. He went through the things that the cup was, that cup of suffering that came to him He suffered through that, even though he asked if it was possible for it not to happen. Jesus, who believed in prayer, sometimes didn't get a positive answer. And you and I sometimes pray, and we don't get the answer that we were hoping for, or we don't get an answer at all. I want you to think about that for a second. This idea of just not now. How many things do we pray for? And I made a list of some things where I need it for my family, I need it for my career, that promotion is coming up, I'm praying that God will give that to me, I've worked really hard, I've tried really hard to do it, and yet I seem to get not now, because it doesn't doesn't come to me. Or maybe it's success in my business, things are not going as well as I hoped, God please help us have a success in our business, and I seem to get an answer that says not now, because it's certainly not changing. What about this one? You know, I, I, I work hard, I try to be a good friend, and I'm overlooked again and again and again, and I would really like to be appreciated. I would really like for people to just notice that I exist, and yet I keep getting, not now. How about 
I would really love to have someone to share my life with. Keep praying, but I'm not getting a yes. I don't know what I'm getting, but maybe I'm getting a not now. Our children are unfaithful. We pray to God, ask them to please come back, and what happens? Nothing. And I'm wondering what the answer to that prayer is. Is it possibly not now? My marriage is not happy. I would love for it to be better. I pray to God that we will get along, that everything will work out, and yet the answer apparently is not now. I have a loved one who is in desperate condition. We pray. We want them to get better. It doesn't seem to be happening. And I wonder, I have a sense today that... uh, All of us have that at one time or another, in one way or another, that that kind of thing happens to us. And I think we need to hear a a word from the Lord today about prayer. Uh, How am I supposed to deal with it? How am I supposed to see it? How am I supposed to understand it? When he's told me to pray and he's told me he'll answer, and yet I don't seem to be getting any answers at all, what are we supposed to do? And I think we need at least one section today about prayer, and that would be from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. I want us to get a word from the Lord about that. Turn there with me. We're going to read all 13 verses. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. We'll spend most of our time here. And it came about that while he was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Suppose one of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he shall answer and say, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he'll get up, and he'll give him as much as he needs." And I say to you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he's asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If then you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? I want you to notice how this section began. Jesus is doing what he's teaching. It says that he was already praying in verse 1. It came about that while he was praying in a certain place, he didn't just teach us how to pray. He prayed. It's important that you need to know that the one in whose footsteps we follow actually prayed. This is the Son of God, and he prayed. It seems to me that if he did, then I need to learn how to do it as well. And so Luke tells us about it. By the way, did you know that Luke emphasizes prayer more than, in particular to the prayers of Jesus, more than any other gospel writer? He lists nine prayers that Jesus prayed, and seven of those nine prayers are found nowhere else except in the gospel of Luke. He has a unique way of showing us Jesus. So I just want to tell you that you have Jesus who knows prayer from both ends. On the one hand, he's prayed. On the other hand, he makes intercession for us at the throne of God. He sees this from both sides. There is no better teacher in all the universe than Jesus when it comes to prayer. And I want to draw out four lessons, just four lessons from the text that we've just read that I think will help us when we get confused about why isn't he answering me? I think this is important. And so spend some time with me as we look at the four lessons that Jesus is teaching us. Here's lesson number one. I need to make prayer God-centered and God-exalted. The disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. 
And the first thing he does when he teaches them to pray is to give them a sample prayer, a kind of a summary prayer. It's not something that's to be repeated like a ritual. It's the things you include in your prayer. He said, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. I want you to notice two things. Number one, the name of God is the first and main thing that prayer is about. Spending time understanding and honoring the name of God. When you talk about the name of God, you mean not just what he's called, you mean his reputation, his character, his honor. And he says, may your reputation, your character, your person be hallowed, which means to be reverenced, to be worshiped, to be glorified, to be exalted, to be esteemed, to be cherished. He says, let that happen. That's the very first thing. First and foremost in prayer, I want God to work on my heart by helping me understand who God is. I want to make sure that I start out with the hallowing of his name. He says, when you pray, you do this. And interestingly enough, hotan, or hatan in the word in the, in the Greek here, doesn't just mean when you pray. It means whenever you pray. That means every single time you pray. Make sure that you hallow the name of God whenever you pray. And you're going to pray a lot. Not just, not just prayers that we're going to pray as a kind of a formal prayer that we're going to say every once in a while at public gatherings and we repeat this because that's what Jesus said. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is when you pray, hallow God's name. When you pray, give honor and glory to the name of God. Whenever you pray, express a desire that the name of God be valued more in your own heart that it be valued more in the church, that it be valued more in the world than it is today. Hallowed be your name is a prayer for passion of the soul, revival in the church, and awakening in the world. We're praying that as we actually begin that. So when we gather today and when we pray, it's not really about us. It's not really about us. It's about him. I think so many of our prayers are about us. And, and yes, we have needs and we have things like give us this day our daily bread. That's all our needs. We, we obviously have needs, but it's really not about us. It's about what God is doing. And God blesses us when we're about him. It's about God. It's about his name. It's about his glory, his majesty, his mission in the world, his love. It's about his salvation. Listen to Psalm 40, verse 16. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Hallowed be thy name. That's what it means. The same thing. Let your name be supreme above all things and let it be supreme above the joy of all people. Your name above everything else. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. It's really about Him. It's always been about Him. And if I don't get that, my prayer's not going to be what it needs to be. Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Or Psalm 86, verse 12. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Honored, glorified be your name. The very first thing that I want you to do is to realize that when you're praying to God, you are praying to God. It's not just something we say to make ourselves feel better. It's not something we just do so that God will make sure that he meets all my needs. The first thing that I want is the name of God to be glorified in the whole world. Hallowed be your name. Here's a second lesson that I get from what we've looked at, and it's important that God answers prayer for penitent people, not perfect people. Now, the reason that I say that, and we're going to look at it in the text here in just a second, is because I want it to be a balance to something else that God has also said that sometimes paralyzes us from praying. In Psalm 66, verse 18, the psalmist said, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. 
And, and what he's telling you is that if you're treasuring wickedness and not penitent in your life, God's not going to hear you. This is, this is important to understand. And, and so it ought to make us search our hearts. If I've been praying and I don't seem to be getting any answers, I think the first thing that I want to ask myself is, is there's something in me that's blocking God from answering me. Is there an unconfessed sin? Is there, a, uh, is there some kind of a passion that I treasure that's keeping me from doing God's will? And is that the reason I'm not getting the answer? And we really probably ought to ask ourselves that. What am I doing that may be blocking the ability of God to answer my prayer as I'm asking it? Did I fall short because of sin? Are my attitudes displeasing to God? Are my actions those that are separating me from God? Is that really what's happening? Is that hindering my prayer? And I need to ask that question, but, but that's not really what this text is talking about. It's talking about something else. If I'm not careful, I will look at my sinfulness in my life and I will say, God's not going to answer me, and so I just get paralyzed. I don't really expect any kind of answer. After all, is there anybody here who can say, I've never sinned? You can't do it. Is there anybody here who can say, I haven't sinned last week? You can't do it. Everybody here, either by omission or commission, every single one of us do. We're sinners. We, everything we do is imperfect. I, I, that's who we are. I can just tell you that's who we are, that everything we do because of our nature is, is imperfect. But God answers the prayers of penitent people. Not perfect people. There are all kinds of texts. And I, I, I think about just right now some Old Testament texts. And I'll get back to this text in just a moment. Where sinful people pray to God and God answers them even though what they're going through is a direct result of their own sin. They're, they're in deep trouble and it's because of the bad choices that they have made. And yet God answers them. I, I want to just read a few of them as an example. Psalm 38, verse 4 and verse 15. My iniquities have gone over my head. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. For in you, O Lord, I hope you will hear, O Lord my God. He says, I'm hoping in you because I know you're going to hear me. He's, he has iniquities that are covering him up. And he says, I know you're going to hear me. Or Psalm 40, verses 12 and 13. For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I'm not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Sinners, yeah. God going to help them? Absolutely. Psalm 107, verses 11 through 13. Because they rebelled against the words of the Lord and despised the counsel of the Most High... Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. In every one of those cases, you have people who are suffering because of sin and God hears their prayer. He will even though we aren't perfect. He will even though we often sin. But the text itself says that and I want you to notice a couple of verses together. Okay, and then we're going to look a little down, uh, even at verse 13. But I want you to look at verses 2 and 4. In the text, Jesus says, whenever you pray, say, remember, the word means whenever. Whenever you pray, say, and then he told them what to say. Among the things that he told them what to say is verse 4, where he says, and forgive us our sins. What is that saying? Whenever you pray, pray about your sins, because I can tell you, they're there, but God will hear it. You connect the beginning and the middle, and whenever you pray, forgive us our sins. So that means just like I say every time, in one way or another, God, your name is great, I give glory to your name. I also, every time I pray, say, forgive me of my sin. I say that because I sin often, and I need to realize that I'm not that good. Jesus knows that we're going to need forgiveness virtually every time we pray. He knows that. He knows we're sinners. He knows we don't do everything right. 
And then look at verse 13. We read it a while ago, but I want you to go all the way down to that last verse that we read, verse 13. And I want you to hear, listen to what he says, because he's not talking to the crowds in general. If you look, he's answering his disciples who have just said, teach us to pray. This is not a lesson he's given to everybody else. This is a lesson he's given to his closest group. These are the people who are disciples of his. And listen to what he says. If you then, being evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask them? He uses some strong language here. He says, you, you disciples are evil. And you're also my disciples. What does that mean? It means that, yeah, the, the, the process of sin, even though you are going to become a child of God, and you think about us, we were baptized for the remission of sins. We became new creatures in Christ. All those things are true about us. And yet, Paul says, sin still lives in me. The principle of sin, that weakness of the flesh, is still in all of us, and so we all sin. If I have to be perfect in order for God to answer my prayer, I just may as well never try to pray at all. But that's not what he's telling us. He's talking about if you regard sin in your heart, he won't hear it. means if you treasure it, hold on to it, and won't let go of it, yes, he won't hear you. On the other hand, if you're a sinner, and you are, and you come and say, please forgive my sin, he said, I'd like nothing better. That's what I want. That's what I want with you. I'm looking to forgive. I'm looking to make your life beautiful and wonderful because that's what God actually wants to do. He doesn't mean their prayers couldn't be answered. I'm going to tell you, as long as this sinful age lasts, we who are disciples are living in a world where evil comes, temptation comes, and if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Yes, we have sin. We're gradually overcoming that sin by the power of God and the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. But the tendency to sin is not obliterated by the fact that we became a Christian. So if we recognize that we sin and we fight it and we cling to the cross as our hope, I cling to the love of God and the blood of Christ as my hope, then he forgives me of my sin and answers my prayer. So prayer is not for perfect people. Because none of us are. Prayer is for penitent people. Here's a third lesson here that I think is important, particularly if you've been praying and you're not getting an answer or you're not getting the answer that you feel that you should. There's something you need to know about your Heavenly Father. He never gives us a snake whom we ask for a fish. He never gives us something that will harm us. Read verses 11 through 13 again. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts? Or excuse me, the Holy Spirit. Other translations or other versions of the of the. A prayer here. It says, give good gifts. But in Luke, he says, your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask them. Ordinary dads, okay? If, uh, if an ordinary dad has a son that's hungry and he said, could you give me an egg? Are you going to give him a scorpion? Are you going to give him a snake to bite him? Is that what you're going to do? No, you're not going to do that. Dads who are real dads don't do stuff like that. Yeah, there's some abusive dads out there, but normal dads don't do that. Balanced dads don't do that. And then he says, if you as a dad, even if you can't give him the egg, even if you can't give him, even if you can't or won't at the time give him a fish, you're not going to give him something to hurt himself. You're going to give him something that will help him. He said, you need to know this about God. If an earthly father would do that, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He's saying, it's so much better. God is so much better a dad than we are. And I try to be a good dad. I I want to tell you that he's 
better than I will ever be. Obviously, he's God. He's the ultimate father. Every family on earth is named from him. He's, he's the first and greatest father that's ever been. How much more? If we don't give snakes and scorpions to our children, how much less will God give snakes and scorpions when we ask? So how do I deal with this? I need to know that a perfect father always gives to his asking children what's good for them. What I ask for is not always what's good for me. If I had gotten everything that I asked for when I was a teenager, I would have had a condo on the beach somewhere in some exotic country. I, I would have had a sports car that would have outrun all my friends. If I had gotten everything I asked for, but my dad was a good dad and he didn't give me any of those things. I remember when he did tell me if I would keep my nose clean, there might be something in the driveway for me when I left for college. I didn't know it was gonna be a single speed bike, but still, he gave me what was best. He wanted to give me what was best for me. And I need to understand that. God is Father. I'm the child. Children don't always know what's best. God does. He, he's the ultimate Father, and He knows. If, if God had to give me, listen to this carefully, if God had to give me everything that I asked for, I'm going to ask you, who's in charge then? You or God? Who's the father and who's the child? If everything you want is what you get, obviously that's not the way that works. It's not the way that works because I don't have the ability to be in charge of the universe. I can't see the millions of things that God can see that all intersect to my prayer at this very moment. I can't see all that. I don't know all that. God does. So what I want to tell you is that whether he says no or whether he says wait, He's not doing it to harm me. He's doing it to help me. It's the way he is because he's God. He'll continue to decide how to run the universe the way he wants. And by the way, he didn't consult me on how to run the universe, so I'll allow him to go ahead and do it. But can I tell you one more thing about that, the utterly amazing thing? God does run the universe, but he lets us participate so that he actually does answer prayer. You know, it would be easy for God to say, look, I know what's best all the way around. And so since I know what's best, just forget that stuff about asking for anything because I'm just going to handle all of it, okay? But he does answer prayer. And he sometimes answers prayer in ways that he wouldn't have done it had it not been for your prayer. The will of God ultimately cannot be changed. His immediate will is dependent upon me, my prayer, the circumstances of our lives, and God listens and he answers. It really does change things. You really can pray for a clear day. You can pray for the promotion. You can pray for your daily bread. And oftentimes he gives it. Oftentimes he gives it when he might not have had I not prayed. He set the entire foundation of the world upon the idea of our participation in it. And prayer does change things. It does because God does. He's our Father. And when he hears his children, he responds. He's not deaf. He's not indifferent. He's not powerless. He hears us, and he acts. Then how should we respond when things don't seem to work out? And that brings me to lesson four, and I want you to go back to verses five through eight. Look at verses 5 through 8. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on, my, on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot arise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he's his friend, yet because of his persistence, He'll rise and give him as many as he needs. So what's the point of the parable? Look at verses 9 and 10. So I say to you, ask, and, and I, I, I wish you would read the, be able to see the Greek here and the tenses of the Greek because this is what Jesus is saying. I say to you, keep on asking and it will be given to you. 
Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who keeps on asking receives, and he who keeps on seeking finds. And to him who keeps on knocking, it will be open to him. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. If that doesn't seem to be working, what do you do? Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. But why did he compare his prayer to the friend who didn't want to get up and help him? Why would he do that? He, 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 he does have a friendship with him, but he's really not willing to get out of bed to give him that. He's already in bed. He doesn't want to do it. And, and yet, the friend, if he had gone home, by the way, he would have never gotten an answer. I will just tell you, if the guy had just stopped after that and gone home, uh, he wouldn't have had anything for his friend that had come on the journey. But he doesn't. He just keeps knocking on that door. And how's the guy going to sleep? How's his family going to sleep? He's not getting up because you're his friend. He's getting up because he can't stand the fact that you won't quit knocking on his door. And what's, what's Jesus saying? He's saying that if you keep knocking on the door, God will get irritated enough that he'll finally do something? Is that what he's telling us about this? Is he telling us that God is tired and doesn't want to get up? Is he telling us that God is stingy? Obviously, he's not telling us anything. Because verse 13 says he's ready and able to give. That's what God does. That's what he wants to do. So what is he telling us? What is he telling me when I don't seem to be getting a yes? I think it's a striking, shocking way of telling us that God has his reasons for waiting. As strange and as provocative as it may seem to you, he says, you keep knocking on my door. You keep pounding on my door. I'm not the friend who doesn't want to get out of bed but then does. But I want to tell you something. I will hear you, and I will answer if you keep on knocking. I don't want you to stop knocking. That's a clear thing. Keep on knocking. Because he was persistent, the friend was given as much as he needed. The point is, keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. It seems odd, but it's clearly the biblical teaching all the way through about what we do and why we do it. A number of years ago, Beverly, when we were in South Georgia, had a stroke. I was finishing up a gospel meeting, and she had a stroke, and we took her to a little hospital in Hinesville, Georgia. I'll never forget that, and you've heard, many of you have heard this story before. I've never felt so powerless in my life. I think couples at some point contemplate what life would be like if their spouse died. But I want to tell you that I had never contemplated what life would be like if Beverly was permanently disabled. The changes that that would bring about to us. I was frightened. And I prayed. And everybody that was in my contact list, I sent them a text message, and I said, knock down heaven's door tonight. You pray. At 1.23 in the morning, the stroke hit full blast, and Beverly lost the full use of her left side. She would cry, and she would laugh, and try to move something and not be able to. And I was helpless. So I did what the hospital probably didn't want me to do. I climbed up in the bed with her, and I held her. And I said, it will be okay. And I held her until she quit crying and went to sleep. I believe in knocking down heaven's door. I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. Beverly fully recovered from two strokes that she had within a week of each other. And the only residual effect she has is a good excuse. It's really true. Whenever you ask Beverly something, she's a, and she says, I forgot about that. And if you look at her kind of funny, she says, remember, I had a stroke. And they go, oh, oh, okay, okay, that's fine. 
I forget something, I say, remember my wife had a stroke, and they said, so what? That's the way that works, but that's the only residual effect she has. It's been an amazing thing. God answers prayer, and I'm thankful for that. I am, but I believe in persistent prayer. So why does God want us to persist in prayer? I mean, if he knows we need it, why does he just give it? Why does he make us wait sometimes? And why does he sometimes make us wait till eternity? Why in the world does he do that? There was an old Puritan preacher, and, and his name was Thomas Watson. He lived 350 years ago. And he wrote a book called Body of Divinity. And he answered just this question. He said, I don't know all the answers, but I have four ideas that I want to share with you. And I think they're worth sharing. He said, and I want you to just think about it, that God wants us to persist in prayer because he loves to hear the voice of prayer. He said, you let a musician play a great while before you throw money toward him because you love to hear his music. He said, maybe that's one of the reasons that it pleases God that we pray to him. He said, in the second place, it may be that he is humbling us that we may too easily assume that we merit some ready answer or that God is in our beck and call like a butler and not as the sovereign Lord that he is and the loving Father that he truly is. Maybe it humbles me. He said in the third place, perhaps it's because he sees, uh, sees we are not yet fit or ready for the mercy we seek. It may be that he has to put into place in us or in the church or in the world certain things before the answer to the prayer can actually occur. And so he's busy doing the things that make the answer possible in us. And he said, number four, finally, that the mercy that we pray for be the more prized and the more sweet when it finally comes. Enduring, persevering prayer. Even when you don't seem to be getting an answer, Jesus says, keep on praying. When you don't seem to get an answer, keep on praying. And let us not grow weary, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Long ago, and I've seen different things, so I don't know. It's an anonymous soldier who was wounded in a war wrote these words, and I love them. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for help that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am, among all men, most richly blessed. God does what is best. But I do know this. I know that he said if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you won't have to wait for that prayer to be answered. At the moment that I come to him in penitent prayer, asking that he would forgive me, he does. Because he is the best father that's ever been. If you need to be baptized to have your sins washed away and become a part of the family of God, Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. I believe him. Trust him and do that. And if you need to ask for prayer, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. I love that. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, James 5, 16. And there are righteous people here who are willing and waiting and wanting to pray for you. God is here 
right now. And he's the best father that's ever been. Trust him. Wait for him. And don't stop praying. Why don't you come while we stand and sing? Seated, please. Thank you for being here this morning uh, to worship with us. We're grateful for everyone's presence. We're grateful for those that are joining us online. Um, if you're visiting with us this morning, if you would, uh, would you take in front of the on the pew in front of you? There's a red card. If you don't mind filling that out and putting your name on that sticker, that way we can uh, greet you um, after service. We'll be having classes following uh, our worship, and so if you need to find a class, we've got our classes listed uh, at the information desk out front. We've got uh, some announcements this morning. We have several people that have lost family members recently. Uh, we want to extend our sympathy to Jerry Schwiger and the family and the death of his wife, Linda. The funeral was held yesterday, and a family burial will be tomorrow, March the 18th at 2 p.m., at the Middle Tennessee Veterans Cemetery. We also want to extend sympathy to Terry Anderson and her family and the death of her father, Bobby Ayers. That funeral was also yesterday at the Antioch Church of Christ in Raymer, Tennessee. Our sympathy is extended to Jamie Ladd and her family and the death of her father, Jackie Stevens. Visitation will be Monday, March the 18th, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., with a celebration of life service to follow at 1 p.m. All will be held at the First United Pentecostal Church in Nashville. Jackie was also the grandfather of Cayman, Carson, and Josie Ladd. Um, also, Heather Feenstra and her family and the death of her father, Jim Martin. 
visitation will be Monday, March the 18th from 11 to 7 p.m. and again on Tuesday, March the 19th from 11 to 1. The funeral will follow at 1 p.m. and all will be held at Cole and Garrett Funeral Home in White House. Uh, we've got a few changes. Um, Lois Anderson, who suffered a fall, she is now at Woodcrest at Blakeford. Um, Pam Thweet has been moved to Woodcrest at Blakeford, and she's in room number 142. Georgia Burner is now recovering at Bethany, number, uh, room number 224. Um, Jean Chance is back in the hospital. She's in Murray uh, Regional, and she's suffering with low sodium. Uh, we want to continue to remember Mike Green in our prayers. He's home doing rehab after recent surgery. And Phil Wagner is continuing his mission trip in Panama. I mentioned last Sunday that we had a group leaving last week uh, to go join him, and part of that information was correct. They're actually leaving this week. So uh, if you would uh, keep those in your prayer that will be going down to work with Phil in Panama. Um, there's going to be an elders, deacon, and ministers meeting uh, next Sunday, the 24th, at 3 p.m. in room 415. And the children's ministry is needing large bags of Easter candy to be placed on the green children's ministry table in the foyer. And this is for our Easter egg hunt on Saturday, March the 30th. So those are all our, our announcements. Uh, let's have a prayer, and then we'll have a closing song. Dear God, we are so grateful for this time that we've had to be together as a church family to worship you. We're thankful for the time we've had to remember Christ's death on the cross for our sins. We're grateful for all those that helped conduct our worship. We're grateful for the great lesson on prayer that Bill presented to us. We pray that you would be with all those that were mentioned this morning that need you. They need your comfort because they've lost family members. We pray for those that are in the hospitals and we know uh, there are many more with us this morning that are hurting and need your help and need your comfort, and we pray for those at this time. We ask that you would be with us this week and help us to be a good example to those around us, and we're just so grateful for your church and what it means to all of us. We ask that you would forgive us when we fail you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. I hope you'll all come back tonight at 5 o'clock for our evening worship. And let me just say a word about next week at 5 o'clock uh, on Sunday, the March 24th. We're going to have a very special evening, what we're calling Faith, Food, Fellowship, and Fun. Um, and we'll have a, a powerful but abbreviated worship service together starting at 5 o'clock. And then we're going to go down to the Activity Center and have uh, the food and fellowship. And if I can throw in another F family time together, and so uh, we're going to have a good old-fashioned Creve Hall potluck. It's been a while since we've had one of those, and so if you come, we're going to ask that you bring a, a dish or two, um, finger food or casserole or dessert, whatever, and then we're going to have a little fun, hopefully. Uh, some of you may have seen an email or several emails this week uh, with some survey-type questions. If I could throw in another couple Fs, we're going to play a little family feud, friendly feud, and... Um, using your answers to several questions, and uh, it'll be a fun time together. Some of the, the questions, for example, um, Creve Hall member that you think would do the best at, on Bible Jeopardy, that's not me, um, an elder who likely got into the most trouble as a child, that could be all of them, um, an elder or minister with the best hair, if it said worship leader, obviously I would win, sorry Connor, but... Um, but there's a lot of fun questions like that about the Creve Hall members. And then there's also some Bible-based questions. The fruit of the Spirit I struggle with most. The apostle I'd most like to interview. So some interesting Bible-type type questions. And then some other just general uh, fun questions as well. If you did not get that survey or if you haven't had a chance to fill it out, there's still time. Uh, if you want to see myself or Connor or Andy or uh, the office, the church office, they can get that to you. Uh, we'll probably have to wrap that up tomorrow or early Tuesday, but we'd love for as many of you as possible to answer those questions so we can get some results back, and it'll be a lot of fun to see how the congregation responded to questions like that, and so that'll be our fun time together. We hope you'll all come next Sunday night. It should be a wonderful night uh, together. As we close today, we're going to sing this prayer, 
and uh, then we'll be dismissed to our classes. Uh, if you look in the book, there's an amen at the end of this prayer, and so I don't think it'll be on the screen, but we're going to sing the amen at the end of this prayer, if you don't mind. And then, uh, and then, like I said, we'll be dismissed to our classes, and our teachers can be dismissed as we sing. Let's stand for this song, please. Let's greet each other with a smile as we head to Bible class.